Mm, hi everyone, welcome to ST Skills. Uh, this is a weekly system design series um, at Saturday 9 a.m. PST. Um, this, I mean, like the format of this is like we have a mock interview on one weekend and alternate week, like we do a deep dive on one of the system design topics. If you'd like to participate or volunteer for these sessions, um, either as for a mock interview or for a um, system design uh, deep dive, um, please uh, go to sport.stskills.com and uh, sign up. So this week uh, we have uh, Asim um, as an interviewer and Bhumik as an interviewee. Um, so the format of mock interview is like we all uh, as an audience listen to the mock interview that happens between interviewer and interviewee Asim and Bhumik uh, for 50 minutes. And then like we collectively discuss the feedback on how we can do this better and learn from each other. And um, with this, I'll give the forum to Asim and Bhumik to get started with the mock interview. Sure, thank you, Naga. Here, Bhumik. Uh, yes, doing good. Thank you so much for doing this. Okay, no problem. Okay, Bhumik, uh, today we are going to design a system. Do you know about caching? Hmm, yep. Okay, so. Uh, I want to design a system like a distributed cache. Okay. And but if you want to discuss about what is cache and other things, I'm open to discuss. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I would like to understand where are you planning to use this cache because there can be multiple mm -hmm. nuances to this. So mm -hmm. if we can maybe. So this is the uh, brief problem statement that is designed the distributed cache, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So now let's, uh, uh, this is uh, very generic. So let's identify the use cases for this. Maybe mm -hmm. that will help us uh, take some design decisions in the right directions. Sure. Uh, think about you have a system uh, where it could be like a website or a uh, overall system which has website, lot of services and database. We want to avoid like a wrong trip to the database. So if I can use cache in between, mm -hmm. which could store my data so I can avoid uh, having a wrong trip to, to my databases. Okay. So um, one thing which uh, I would like to clarify is that when we are using the cache, I think we are going through some sort of eventual consistencies and there can be Mm -hmm. some issues going on with the write operation and the read operation. So uh, is the system uh, strongly consistent? What is the system's expectation? Who is going to use this cache? Uh, what do you think? What it I, should? I think it should be eventual consistency because uh, if I'm just reading through the cache and again, we can go into the details of the cache that mm -hmm. uh, what are the main components of the cache? Uh, in the cache, I think we will have uh, the time to live and the uh, cache invalidation strategies and things like that. So there can be some sort of delay in getting the the most up to date data reflected back to the users. And this being a distributed cache, there are high chances for those things as well. So maybe we can start with the eventual consistency promise and then mm -hmm. uh, see if we want to do better than that. Sure, eventual consistency is good. But be aware, okay. like this is distributed cache. There will be network partitions. Yep, yep. Okay. Cool. So let me think a little bit more on what. Okay. Uh, and uh, we are designing a very generic cache. So it is just a key value uh, system where value can be any sort of object, right? Sure. I'm, I'm fine with that key value. Okay. And, um, I have uh, read about the memcache and the mm -hmm. Redis. So mm -hmm. uh, I think in both of them, the main difference is that memcache provides just in memory, whereas Redis provides in memory plus some sort of persistence. So maybe we can talk about those things as well. That is, is it just in memory or both? Uh, 
in memory uh, and persist no, for now i am not uh, that much bothered how internally we are able to persist okay okay so cool. we can come, circle back later if we have time but uh, that's okay. kind of abstraction to me okay okay what else should i know about this cache okay uh, let me take one uh, scenario uh, for mm -hmm. example facebook mm -hmm. right and maybe uh, use that as an example to identify where would the cache fit in and how we can you know just uh, focus on to the caching component of the whole system would, would that be an okay approach to just identify the right use cases and sure, sure. zoom into uh it if facebook is a, a good way to elaborate i'm good otherwise we uh, if you want you can take a very simple example like a employee system or a student system where employee id and something okay Up to you okay okay cool um so yeah let's let's do this it's a very simple example we can start with that is i have this user which mm -hmm. is now going and interacting with my web server i'm just uh, skipping mm -hmm. some levels in the middle so that i can quickly come to the cache and mm -hmm. then for example the web server is talking to database mm -hmm. now uh, in the ideal case each time the user calls the api which are hosted on this web server they are always going to call the database for both uh, read and write operations and calling the database involves io and i think that is the most expensive operations in this uh, very minimalistic flow so mm -hmm. that is where I, uh, we would like to introduce our cache right mm -hmm. so let's introduce the cache here and this is my web server again I call this my cache. Mm -hmm. So there are a uh, couple of ways in which we can uh, go about this cache. Uh, one thing is that multiple strategies to writing into the cache. One is, uh, I think, look aside. So let me put it here. Then I can have. right through and maybe there are some other strategies as well but uh, uh i would say i have seen mostly these two types of caching uh, in which first the look aside would mean that whenever my server is trying to uh, get anything from the database it would first check in the cache and mm -hmm. if there is a cache miss then it would go to the database then write to the cache and then uh, respond so there are multiple hops there and uh, the web server is still responsible to know about the database and to understand how to uh, deal with the database so there are just some pros and cons there but when we we are doing the write through cache what we would usually do in that approach is is we would first look at the cache if the data is in the cache well and good we'll just return the data right then but if the data is not there then we would let the cache talk to the database get the data back and then serve the data from the cache so uh, think in that way we are only dealing with look aside uh, yeah okay okay so let's focus on the look aside component only okay so uh, this scenario covers i think the scope of the requirements we want to focus on right so, uh, so i think what a... operations you would do on the cache okay that's a good point so i would have a write operation so mm -hmm. uh, write meaning uh, write or update i think i'll not yeah that's write and update then mm -hmm. i'll have a read operation and mm -hmm. then i'll have some invalidate uh, operation that is uh, we can use uh, some sort of strategy which would be lru a strategy okay. the standard one and uh, i think so once we talk about in eviction policy right sorry there is your eviction policy 
Yes, yes, okay. Let's call it eviction policy. Okay, and yeah, I'm good with LRU for now. Yeah, and uh, this also means that we need to uh, identify the size of each record we want to allow and the total cache size as well, because at times the cache is going to be in memory. That That's how we can get the best out of it. Yeah, so uh, we can talk about keeping it in SSD and whatnot, but let's consider just keeping this in the memory to get the best of the performance. Mm -hmm. And that limits uh, how much I can store per machine or per, per server. So mm -hmm. maybe we want to put some restrictions around how much can be the size of each entry, uh, something like that. Uh, right now, I'm not that much bothered about the size of entry. We can come up with some optimal number, how many records and sizes could be stored. But okay. I think it could be, we can again circle back on that. Okay, okay, cool. Then uh, shall we go over those uh, APIs which we want to have in the cache, the read, write, and eviction policy? Sure. Okay. So, mm, I think the best way to put that would be we can just continue writing here. Mm -hmm. So a write API is going to, so when, when, when will I be calling the write API? I'll be just calling the write API when there is a cache miss, right? Mm -hmm. So the web server uh, talks to the cache, the cache doesn't have the data, hence web server talks to the uh, database directly and then it writes back to the cache. So uh, invoke after a cache miss and after getting the data back from the DB. And here also uh, this, uh, this may not be relevant for the current discussion since we are just focusing on the distributed cache, but mm -hmm. inside the cache, it's up to the web server on how the web server wants to write the data to the cache. I mean, what mm -hmm. type of data? The web server can write just whatever is the records uh, the server is getting from the DB or maybe just create a well-defined object, which they are using for, in, in our case, maybe a person object and just serializing the person object into yeah. the cache. So this is- I'm fine, like any serialization. Yep, yep, okay. So this is my uh, write API and I think the- uh, So how your write API would look like you are just doing- Okay, so let's come to the signature of that. So uh, write would take a key mm -hmm. and a value, right? Yeah. And uh, the cache is going to be a very big hash table. So uh, if, I, if the key already exists, then we exist, then we will just overwrite. Mm -hmm. overwrite. Else, we would just create a new entry in this big hash table mm -hmm. and send the response back. Does this look all right or do, should I yeah, go into okay. further details? I think for now it looks all right. Let's move further. Okay. And then uh, for the read API. So read mm -hmm. API would need a key which mm -hmm. was first used to mm -hmm. uh, write into the cache, right? So. Uh, again, the read API is going to look like something like this. Uh, it expects a key. And if key exists, return value from the table, from the hash table, mm -hmm. else maybe return null or we can come back with some set type of contract with the client on how do we want to qualify sure. or how do we want to tell the client. Yep, yep, sounds good to me.
client like there was a cache miss so it's mm -hmm. mm -hmm. sorry i think between your voice broke for me. The, but uh, yeah so this this is going to be a very high level of the read api this yeah, so I was just summarizing the read API. That is, okay, this is okay. a very high level of the read API. Shall, shall I? No, okay. no, no, I think we're sure. good. Uh, let's move further. Okay, so uh, now we also need the eviction policy. So eviction policy can be, yeah. So eviction policy can be done in multiple ways. That is, we can go over all the cache entries periodically and evict some. Uh, so, so there is LRU. Sorry, go ahead. You told LRU, right? Yeah. Or you're thinking about uh, different eviction policies? Yeah, so uh, uh, we are simplifying the cache a lot right now. That is, we are not asking the server to put any time to live or anything, right? Mm -hmm. So we are just basically saying that if the entry is in the cache, then uh, we just, uh, I'm not sure whether what I'm talking about is eviction or invalidation policy, because what I'm concerned about right now is that I am not forcefully evicting anything out of the cache unless the size is full. And then at that time, I'll be just uh, removing the least recently or last recently used uh, element. So that means that the elements can stay in the cache for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And this being a look aside cache, there are chances of serving the stale data from here. So that makes me feel that we should have some sort of time to live. And based okay. on this time to live, we should be also be refreshing the cache and uh, getting those entries out of the cache so that there would be a forced cache miss and new entries would be added from the database. So, yeah, I think we can then add like line seven somewhere, LRU plus uh, TLS. So uh, yeah, then let's. So uh, in in the right operation, I can keep looking at the size of the hash table and use the. So I'm just updating my right method, and instead of just adding the entry, check if the size has reached. So. Right. If it is quicker uh, than writing, you can even show me like how, if you want to show how your LRU looks like. Mm, uh, show meaning. Uh... So, so you, you have a hash table, right? Mm -hmm. And that hash table can only have, uh, let's say 10 entries. We only allow 10. Okay. Okay. Cool. So. Okay, let me create something else here. So let's say this is my cache and it has got E value and mm -hmm. the last accessed time, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll have key one, well one, and key one. Mm -hmm. Key two, well two, key two, and so on. Up yeah. To key n, well n, and t n. Now, at any given point in time, uh, whenever I see that, okay, I want to add a new entry into my cache, but uh, the size is full. That means that I need to forcefully remove something which is not recently used. And this yeah. makes sense. If there is an entry which is not re really being used frequently, then mm -hmm. we can free up some space and put something which may have a potential of getting frequently used because it mm -hmm. was just recently added. Mm -hmm. So the right operation would look at the timestamps and identify, and I think we can do some uh, other use, uh, some sort of data structures to mm -hmm. quickly identify uh, what what is the latest time of use. And the read API will also 
uh, keep updating the timestamp whenever there is a read call for a particular key. So, so that it is always, uh, if something is read, then I'll update the last access time. If something is written, then I'll update the last access time. And I'll also look at the last access time. So both read and write will be aware of the last access time. And uh, in the write operation, I'll find out that, okay, the uh, entry key two was the one which was, uh, which was the last uh, or which hasn't been used recently. Then I'll just take it out and add the key n plus one there. N plus one and T n plus one. Does this make sense? So what is key n plus one? So I have reached the key n, right? That means that now when I'm adding the n plus one key to the cache, mm -hmm. I, I'm facing the issue of the size. Mm -hmm. So that is when I'm going through the cache and identifying the entry, which has not been recently used. So turns out key two was that entry. So mm -hmm. I evicted key two out of the cache and added key n plus one. That so was how you, so you, you went record by record and then you found, okay, something is least recently used and then you removed it. Is it like that? Uh, so if we want to go about the algorithm of this, then uh, we can definitely introduce further data structures which would keep track of which, which entry was the one which was recently used or maybe maintain a similar mapping based on the timestamps so that we, we can identify the entries into the ascending or the descending order of the timestamp and okay. then quickly evict them. So I'm just simplifying things for now for uh, maybe for okay. the bigger design, but algorithm, we would al always want the cache to be really fast with some additional data structure. So I, I would want to implement an algorithm which would be order of one to identify mm -hmm. which entry should go out. Going through mm -hmm. all the entries in the cache doesn't make sense to find the candidate for eviction. Okay, I think I'm good for now. Uh, let's settle back uh, if we have time at the end. Uh, let's move further. So, okay. uh, just to summarize, like you, uh, your cache instance would be holding some n number of keys, and then it would be doing two things, uh, like uh, time to live and. Uh, a kind of uh, algorithm for LRU. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, okay. Uh, sounds good to me. Let's uh, proceed further. Uh, how your distributed things look like. Okay, cool. So uh, let's now uh, introduce the distributed aspect by referring to the example of Facebook, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So Facebook is a user sharded system. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would also, and let's say that uh, I just want to get the user profile information. So let me just put something real quick for the uh, database schema that may like make things a little bit more relevant for us. So for example, I have a user table with a name, ID and friend IDs. Just a very simple schema for now. Right, so uh, now whenever I'm uh, querying for the user profile, I want to get these three things from the database all the time. In the case of Facebook, there would be multiple web servers. So let's add more web servers here. And there can be multiple uh, databases instances as well, which would be again uh, user partition. So uh, we are just putting these things in perspective so that we can use the similar sharding and partitioning approaches for our cache as well. Because it it would be better to have the similar. I uh, mean, mean, like uh, we are always using a partition database. Sorry. Are you assuming like there will be always be a partition database? No, uh, I'm not assuming that. I'm just focusing on this Facebook example to uh, no, just draw my, some analogies. My, ca my cache can connect to a NoSQL or a SQL database. Okay, so... Uh, and it that, doesn't matter to the cache actually because we are only doing look aside. 
Okay. Okay. So how this would impact my design? Like I could use a partition or no no uh, like SQL or no SQL database. But if you think like uh, this could be generalized, then please go ahead. Okay. Okay. Let me understand the scenario then a little bit more about uh, what is your data storage uh, story here, because if we are talking abstraction for me, it could be anything for me. It could be like I told, like it's an employee database. Could have millions of records. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Cool. Then not necessarily like uh, uh, from the front end or the web server. We are only looking for employee. We are looking for a department also. It's up to the front end to decide what it wants to store. It wants it to store employee record, a department record, or it could be some other thing. Okay, okay. Then let me take that out of the consideration for now. If we want to bring it back, we'll, we will. But let me just focus with the interaction of the web server and the cache. Okay, mm -hmm. because cache is not dealing with the database. So because of the look aside scenario. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, now the one thing which we would want is since this is a caching mechanism, I would uh, at least try to focus on making sure that one web server talks to the same cache all the time. So there are a couple of things we can do. Um, so maybe that this is something which I would like to clarify further. Mm -hmm. So when, when we are saying the distributed cache, what are we really meaning by that? Are we saying that we just want to maintain multiple replicas of the cache or are we also doing some sort of partitioning inside the cache? And whenever, if we are doing some partitioning inside the cache, then it should be, uh, uh, the web server's responsibility would be uh, uh, to make sure that it is hitting the right cache server. So, uh, what, what what would be the requirements around that? Uh, so, think in that way. You you can start with one server, but mm -hmm. it should be fault tolerant. But if if I adding more records and if I my needs uh, increase, then it has to be separated into multiple servers. So that's why it will become, uh, I think, fully distributed. Now. <laughs> I think it depends on your design, how you want your web server to find out the actual cache and scans. Okay, okay. So let's take this out for now. So let's say that I, uh, for now I have just mm -hmm. one cache instance, right? So this is my cache server one and all the servers would be talking to this cache server. Now. Okay for that uh, the needs are increasing now for the uh, storage and that is forcing me to add multiple cache servers. So what I'll have to do is that I'll just instantiate new instance of this cache server too. And uh, the web servers who are talking to the cache would be using uh, the client side logic, the client here for my cache is the servers. So mm -hmm. uh, the web servers would know that if I if I have a particular, for example, the user ID in our case, uh, I may just say that I have two servers. So uh, I would uh, distribute the users based on some uh, hashing function or something like that. And I'll make sure that I'm writing and reading for the same user always from the same cache server. Mm -hmm. So then it, it is possible that server one and the, let's call this server zero, they are always talking to the cache server one, but this one is talking, uh, this one is talking to the cache server two. So this becomes my, um, the whole cache layer where there are multiple instances of uh, cache servers running. So right. server two can also connect to server one, uh, cache server one, right? Yes, yes. So I'm just uh, giving mm -hmm. one scenario in which okay. the, they are ending up. Uh, it's again on the type of the load which server two is getting. If it is getting some keys which are mapping to the server one, mm -hmm. uh, the cache server one, then yes, it would. This mm -hmm. is just the uh, okay. uh, sure. very uh, simplified uh, scenario. But yeah, that and any server can talk to any cache server based on the uh, key which they want to write or read. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, cool. So, what else shall we uh, shall we talk about? So, looking at this. Uh, so, I just want to check like how how you server two would be able to or server one web server mm -hmm. one or web server two able to find which server it will go and uh, there could be scenarios when new cache servers are coming in and going out or it it, it is gone. So, what kind of strategy you are uh, going to pick? Okay. So, uh, I think I'm not 100% sure, but I'm thinking of maybe adding another load balancer in front of all the cache servers mm -hmm. so that it can decide which cache server it wants to, you know, delegate to, because then everything happens behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So maybe something like this in between here. Okay. Sounds good. I want to add a load balancer and then we can reduce the responsibility from the server. The server can only provide the key to this load balancer. And then this load balancer becomes my single point of failures. And then we can talk about how to make it more robust by doing some active, 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 passive things. But uh, this can alleviate a lot of issues uh, which we want to take care of for the distributed caching here. Okay. So, so still, if we add a, a element like a load balancer or some other component, which would do kind of a navigation for us, so, but still how that guy would know like how many servers are there, or you're assuming that uh, th there's a full, there is already a component which we can use. Mm, so, uh, so the, what I would... So my, so that means my distribu distributed cache comes with this load balancer, hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It is not a simply simple load. It is not exactly a load balancer. Like if I have uh, ten servers and one server is, uh, one server is getting more load, it will send to second server. It no, it needs to be exactly know where it has to go. Yep. Yeah, so. Uh... So load, load balancers like a load balancer. It's a, like a client or a clash cache client to me. Mm, yes, that that is yes th that is the right way to put it. It's a cache client, but the main responsibility for this cache client is to identify which cache server to use when we have multiple cache servers and mm -hmm. make everything. Uh, abstracted out for the clients of this cache server, which is our uh, web servers here, right? So we can uh, call this cache client, but it is again like a one uh, big piece, which is sitting uh, so, between uh, all the servers and the cache servers. So I just want to see like, if you can elaborate more for me, like how okay. this uh... Uh, cache client will make sure like right reaching to right server cache server and if something is gone and something is added new how mm -hmm. like if yeah okay cool so uh, one thing would be so the contract here between the server and the cache client is pretty clear. So now all the read and write requests, they are going through this particular cache client. So now it is the cache client is getting, cache client is getting both the read and write requests. Mm -hmm. So basically gets a key to identify which server this particular request should be forwarded to. Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, we should be maintaining mapping of all the servers and the uh, keys which map to it. I mean, uh, for example, I'm, I have N servers. Maybe we can use some sort of consistent hashing algorithm there. So, uh, I have n servers and I'm getting the key. What in the simplistic manner, what I can do is just uh, get this uh, key, modulo it by n, 
mm-hmm. and, and get the hash of this and then modulate it by n and put it onto the uh, like find the server name which is uh, or the ip address or however it wants to uh, talk to that uh, cache server in, uh, internally but uh, that way given the key it would in the most of the cases map to the same server and if something goes mm-hmm. out of the rotation or if we want to add more things and if we are using the consistent hashing approach that means that uh, only that part of the so consistent hashing would be first of all uh, am i going in the right direction uh, yeah uh, i think yeah you are going in the right direction yeah okay okay so uh, consistent hashing would create a ring like a structure or j- just for the understanding it would be creating a ring and i, I can maybe say that if i have 100 keys then 1 to 10 maps to uh, server 1 then uh, 11 to 20 maps to server 2 and so on and so forth and then 91 to 100 maps to server 10 Mm-hmm. And now if we want to add more servers, so all we need to do is, for example, if server one is getting uh, too much data, it becomes uh, some sort of hotspot. And I want to add more uh, memory, uh, more CPU and memory in between server one and server two. So all I will have to do is that is uh, between server uh, one and server two, maybe I can say that now server one takes just one to five server two take uh, then we will we'll add a new server which let's call it server 11 and then it will be adding it will be taking five to ten and let's call it server 11 right so this way uh, all the keys uh, are unchanged all the mappings remain unchanged there is only one remapping which we had to do and that was all so maybe something like this we can uh, okay, use. Okay, I think I got the idea. Uh, I I want to switch gears here. So so I have some other things to ask you. So are you fine with that? Uh, shall we? Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Okay, cool, thank you. So uh, I just want to see a, a scenario where you are right. Where same <clears throat> multiple requests. Uh, coming for the same key. I want to see how you will handle the concurrency. So when I say concurrency, it could be like uh, uh, you are handling multiple reads, writes, uh, hmm. and other things. Okay, and this is for the same key you are talking about? Yeah, so concurrency like, yes, yeah, same key. Okay, so uh, let, let me understand this a little bit better. So for example, there is one popular user in Let's uh, consider mm-hmm. the case of Facebook, right? And if somebody is, is following some celebrity and uh-huh. we are again and again trying to retrieve that particular celebrity's profile information for all the followers of that celebrity. I think that and would be- celebrity itself also updating its information. Yep, yep. So uh, does that sound like the scenario which you are trying to yeah. focus let's, on? Okay. Yeah, let's check on that. Okay, so if I am getting more and more requests for that, so it would be going to the same cache server again and again because it would be mapping to it would be mapping to the same server, mm-hmm. uh, same cache server. And mm-hmm. uh, since this is out of memory, uh, I mean this this is uh, served through the RAM. I'm not sure uh, if I remember this correctly, but the transactions per second, the QPS, which the which one server could support, uh, considering everything is served out of memory is huge. So uh, what kind of QPS are we looking at here? Maybe that, that would help us draw some lines and maybe scale it a little bit better for this hot partitions case. Yeah, let's say it is not able to handle what you will do. Okay. I, I can't have a really good number on top of my head, but Let's say there is a no, it became a hot spot and it's not able to handle what we'll do here. Hmm. And this is just one user which is causing this one user, or there could be multiple celebrities. Like it can happen. And this okay. scenario repeated itself. Hmm. Okay. So 
couple of things we can do here and uh, that is we can identify the hot partitions and just break them down or maybe we if we know the keys which are running really hot maybe we have some sort of telemetry here which also tells me that what is the cash utilization uh, count for each of the keys that that can help us identify which keys are being frequently used and that will tell us that okay we don't want to keep this high frequent keys onto the same server so maybe we tweak this logic of hashing and uh, distributing the load in such a way that uh, we just distribute this hot keys across various partitions and maybe relive uh, those new partitions of like getting bombarded by all those celebrities uh, sitting on the same server and this will be completely uh, uh, agnostic to the web servers because maybe the cache client or whatever layer we are adding here that can take care of such uh, repartitioning of the hot spot things so you are telling uh, you will repartition your things into multiple some other server or you will add a new server in between i will so the best way would be to add a new server uh, cuz putting it since we are focusing on the consistent hashing uh, i think it would be better to just distribute the load into multiple servers by spinning up a new server uh, so something like that or maybe we can tweak this algorithm to say that hey take use this keys or rather map this keys to this existing set of servers which are underutilized so it, it would be uh, how they help like uh, you are telling for you will just start distributing the celebrities to different servers mm -hmm. that's what is uh, you are proposing so that is one proposal that is if mm -hmm. for example say uh, i in the cache server one i have got 10 celebrities for some reason right they they all mm -hmm. map to the 10 uh, uh, the server one and mm -hmm. the server two is really being underutilized there are no celebrities sitting here and the mm -hmm. utilization or i mean say i would say qps and everything on this particular server is pretty low so this means that the kind of hashing algorithm i used was not really looking at anything like that it was not looking at the key versus the frequency at which that key was accessed so it was not doing any smart uh, routing there it was just uh, uh, doing the uh, hashing so now i have this data and i can use this data to either spin up new server to distribute the load of server 1 which has 10 celebrities or i can just make use of the server 2 which is not really that hot and distribute move those users from server 1 to server 2 something like that so so i see something here like moving things could take time adding new servers could take time how we can solve that okay so let me see one thing which i'm thinking i'm not sure maybe hmm. deviating from the distributed cache approach here mm -hmm. but uh th this high load is happening because multiple users are asking for the same uh, profile multiple followers in our case is asking for the same celebrity to be uh -huh. read again and again right so yeah. something we can do is that we can maybe put the cache on in the memory of the uh, web servers as well but uh, this is deviating from the distributed caching approach which we just talked about but that is one way to uh, maybe uh, solve something like this Mm, but the problem here is the reason why we did distributed is because uh, now every server could have redundant copies. Yep, yep. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I'm not able to think of. Uh, okay, I think uh, that way is here. But uh, I just also want to see. Uh, let's say uh, there is not that much high load, but at the same time we are getting a get tanged uh, uh, update request. How you will handle that? Hmm. Okay. so at the same time if i am getting a get an update mm -hmm. 
so th th uh, there is no promise of uh, the best consistency here mm -hmm. so let me understand this scenario a little bit more so i'm getting a get call mm -hmm. and at the same time i have got a write call so mm -hmm. it's okay what would go wrong here if i'm saying that okay i want to handle the get query first Mm -hmm. uh, and the data is already there in the cache. Then I mm -hmm. may just serve the old data, mm -hmm. and then I'll update the data. I'll I'll have the right operation coming in. And if I have the right, if I choose to take the right operation first, then I'll mm -hmm. write the data and then uh, uh, give the latest. Uh, or the get doesn't really have to lock down on the hash table, right? Mm -hmm. Because what we are saying is that we are eventually consistent here. And uh, the, I'm not sure how how does it matter or what could go wrong there if if I just uh, don't really handle the sequence of get and write here. So so you so user would get so one user would get like old data and at the same time we are updating right. Mm -hmm. So yes, I agree with that. The the requirement is the eventual consistency. But uh, but while you're writing, would you able to read it if you're making some kind of lock? Would you make a lock at that time? I think that particular entry will be locked, but that would, would be you for able a to read it that time. I'm not hundred percent sure. I would want to have a capability of reading the entry. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there are data structures which we can uh, identify which would allow that. I think there would be some which would allow that, but I wouldn't want to block my read operations just because I'm updating the cache or I'm writing into the cache because that is uh, just defeating the purpose of the cache, which, is, which should be serving me the data as soon as possible at the lightning speed. So I, I wouldn't uh, go with locking down the whole record just for the right use case and block all the reads on that. Because there would be a lot of reads going on. Generally, I think there would be a one is to 10 ratio for write and read. So I don't want to block 10 reads if one write is going on. Okay. Yeah. Okay, do you think you want to see like if there are any bottlenecks in the system? Yeah, sure, let's explore that. So uh, again, that whenever there is a one component, it becomes mm -hmm. the bottleneck. So in this one, the one component which I see is the cache client. So that can become bottleneck. So we may want to have uh, backups, active passive or active active copies of this cache client. So that mm -hmm. it, and they can both ping each other, identify which one is up or not, and mm -hmm. take the right role if one of the one of the client goes down. So something like that we can do here. Uh, uh, there can be something going wrong with the cache servers itself. That is a cache server can just simply go down, right? At that time, uh, my cache client would be aware of that. And uh, then we will have to wait for the cache to be completely refed with a bunch of cache misses. Or if we are maintaining some sort of persistence, as I told in the case of Redis, we can just spin up the cache again uh, from what was persisted so far. So something like that can, but I think in, in terms of bottleneck, I just see this cache client as my main bottleneck. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you want to add something or wrap up? We have like, I think two to three minutes. Yeah, sure. So uh, I would like to go back to the requirements and uh, just make sure that we are covering all the major pieces here and mm -hmm. uh, like something critical is not missed. So we have got the uh, write and update API, which are taking care of the time to live, uh, making sure that uh, I'm updating the, or uh, we can expose the time to live and also update the last accessed time when we are writing. And again, we talked about, we don't want to block the entry for read operation, even though I'm writing something, if the entry already exists, we want to let it be uh, read by the clients. And then same thing goes for the uh, read API, that is, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to get the key from the cache if it exists through the cache client, cache client is going to do the routing piece for me. 
and will find the right server, get the key if it exists. If it doesn't, then it would uh, just give me the cache miss uh, error. And if the key existed, then it will update the time to uh, rather the last time, last access time. That would be eventually help uh, be helping the right API. So I think that is taking care of the major scenarios, and we have talked about the eviction policies as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think uh, uh, yeah, this I I don't want to add anything further. This looks good. Okay, cool then. Okay, thanks, Bhumik, uh, for this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Asim. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Asim and uh, Bhumik. I think it was a good session. So now, like, uh, we can switch over to the feedback sure. and see, like, if anyone has anything to add on, like, a sim, and I can add the feedback at the end. But, like, we'll uh, ask the audience first. Um, anyone from the audience wants to share the feedback that you noticed? Yeah, I can add some. Um, maybe it was going a little um, too far or so. Uh, what if, uh, uh, you know, even a single cache server cannot take load of a single key? Like uh, Bhamik was telling about, uh, you know, celebrity, right? You know, maybe hundreds or thousands of people trying to access the uh, profile or some information for a given celebrity at a given point in time. Uh, what if the single cache server itself cannot uh, take load of uh, the same specific key. That's one aspect. And uh, um, there's another thinking that I have, you know, like you said, the problem with the partitioning here, like, you know, identifying the hash, which client server, which cache server it should reside into. Uh, could we have another server which can, you know, uh, keep uh, mapping that this key belongs to the server, this key, you know, some kind of in memory DB, you know, this key goes so that, you know, uh, um, you can partition or you can put keys so that all servers are aligned. So you mean cache for a cache or? No, uh, mm -hmm. uh, information oh, some about mapping. This, some okay. mapping, yeah, okay. in memory mapping that this key belongs to this cache server. Okay. Yeah, otherwise, uh, you know, uh, you did a pretty good job, Bhamik, and Asim. Uh, I believe this is a this is a pretty good design to start with. Well, there can always be improvement, you know, as things go on. And yeah, but this is uh, pretty good. Thank you. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Chintan, and I have one thing regarding to that celebrity uh, thing we came to, right? So, what mm -hmm. if we keep a cache for the users? So let's say we don't keep a cache for a, uh, all the people, but like user wise, like I have five, five, 50 followers or 5,000 followers, right? Uh, I have my own user cache as a user and I will only get update from my user, user cache. So what I'm suggesting is what if we divide a uh, cache by user IDs and keep a uh, table key value pairs, like uh, I, in my user ID, I have 100 row records, key value pairs to show me on my profile or something like that. Just a suggestion, like what if this kind of case we can handle by users cache. And, and in terms of celebrity, we can keep a like active user. So let's say celebrity of 5,000 uh, in which whoever are active users, we just update into their users cache when celebrity post or something. Okay, are you suggesting to have the user ID based cache or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically- uh, What's the benefit of that? Uh, so in terms of celebrity, uh, like it will be very hard to do a, a end process, right? Like say celebrity post something and- Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so, okay. I think this makes maybe sense only for the hot users like celebrities. Yeah. Only hot okay, users. where you were okay, but like you are again overloading those servers, right? Like all of them go to the same server. So mm -hmm. if you are maintaining like one celebrity who is like mm -hmm. very pretty famous, mm -hmm. and all of all the requests go to the same uh, server, mm -hmm. then I mean like I 
don't know like if it's a web server i mean like i don't know if there is a chance of cache but like if you are using the same cache server i don't know if it can handle the throughput the qps which is intended for that uh, celebrity i see okay. mm. i see so yeah mm. any other feedback yeah, so uh, I had so just one, uh, uh, one feedback, I think a couple of things. It was, it was good. Um, so one thing was that like when uh, Asim was asking about uh, concurrency, right? I think mm -hmm. there, uh, I think boom, because there was a little confusion between uh, what concurrency meant. And I think I was getting confused that with uh, uh, the load balancing, hot spots, things like that. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. I think, I, I think he didn't yeah. uh, catch that clearly. That's what I was thinking. And, uh, and, and, and then talking about like uh, either, um, you know, load balancing or even like, I think uh, one more thing was like when he was explaining the uh, uh, constant hashing concepts, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think it depends on the level, it kind of typical interview happens, right? Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it's better to explain the concept, but I thought like, um, you know, I, I don't know if th that much of explanation was really needed. Um, but uh, I, th I think it uh, would have been more helpful, basically, the, the routing part, right? And there are multiple ways to do mm -hmm. it. I think you would have used, uh, one way is basically you can use uh, a what we call outsourcing model, outsourced model, where you can use something like Zookeeper who maintains, uh, you know, all the routing information and then the client just talks to Zookeeper and they get the information from there, right? And mm -hmm. the second way is, uh, you know, completely like a leaderless model where, uh, you know, you can assume all these cache nodes as kind of a leaderless uh, cluster and they are randomly picked the uh, ranges. And then mm -hmm. uh, and the client can randomly descend to any node, and the, but mm -hmm. nodes internally know who is responsible for the internal protocol exchanging information, right? And they mm -hmm. can internally route to uh, up a uh, right uh, node. So I think, the, I think the routing part also was a little bit, I, I think, a mess. And and, and the, going back to the beginning, I think uh, the the cache eviction policies. I thought he would have done a little better uh, on mm. the LRU uh, concept, I think. I, I think I, I thought he mm. would have done a little better. So mm -hmm. that's kind of an overall feedback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah, I mean, like, it's a very good feedback. Thanks for sharing. Thanks. Thank you. Hmm. Um, anyone else? Yeah, I have one thing to add. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, I mean, in my perspective, one thing that that is missed is uh, so we are storing. Uh, I mean, we are building a distributed cache, means one system is not able to manage the keys, so we are mm -hmm. distributing across the machines. So the changes in one system data, how it is propagating to other systems, is I think is missed. Uh, like uh, the keys might be uh, expired, or maybe we are updating some uh, keys in some machine. So how if the same key exists in other uh, nodes, how the how the changes in this node is, I mean, the, basically the sync part, make, making sure the data is consistent. So that part is not covered is, I mean, that's what I feel in my opinion. You mean like the data, how it flows from database to the cache servers, is that part or like the, how you uh, maintain in the cache servers, that sync? Yeah, how, how we maintain in the cache server. Let's say I have a key, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, to increase the availability, let's say I kept the same key in multiple uh, cache servers. And one of them, um, I mean, at some point I wanted to update one key. So my right request went to one of the cache server. So how do I make sure that the other cache server maintaining this key are updated? Okay. Or if you are uh, using uh, this, uh, eviction policy, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there will be some deletions. So these changes also need, need to be propagated, right? Uh, I mean, I don't you know mean whether you, it, you are talking about cache replicas or? Uh... Yes, yes, cache replicas, yes. Oh, okay. I think there was no discussion of cache replicas. Yeah, I agree. I, I think uh, uh, when they talked yeah. about, when they talked about uh, uh, how to increase the throughput, right, for RPS, mm. One mm -hmm. thing would have been re using read replicas, right, to increase mm -hmm. the uh, throughput. And the, if we did, if, if if we went that direction, and then mm -hmm. uh, at that point, yes, you, how do you maintain the consistency between replicas? Since we didn't talk about read replicas at all, and mm -hmm. if each node is responsible for a specific set of 
uh, the key range, right? Or key, either hash range or a key actual range. So the consistency mm -hmm. problem may not be there if we're, we're not doing a replication. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, Bumik, like you can feel free to um like whenever someone is sharing, you can feel free to stop and discuss. Like yeah. Sure. I have a comment uh, on the read replication. So mm. uh, I think I got the nudge, which was mm. uh, in the hot partition, the read replicas would help. Mm -hmm. But um it felt like a bit of extreme, uh, specifically in the case of caching, which is supposed to be producing a really high throughput from one machine, considering everything is a order of one operation and maybe mm -hmm. we can pull yes. up some numbers, but that's why I was not even going into those directions of having uh, backups of the cache servers or replicas of the cache servers, because yeah. it's not yeah. uh, the use case for caching, at least in my perspective. Right. So you basically, I mean, like this maybe, I mean, like instead of saying cache uh, replicas, like uh, local cache, basically, maybe if you have like different uh, regions, like if the users are spread across different regions, you have cache closer to the user, that could be one approach, mm -hmm. but like it. Um, um, uh, actually, I then, disagree uh, on that. I, I, so mm -hmm. the naturally, when we talk about mm -hmm. caching, right, there are, um, mm -hmm. I think as Asim initially started the question, right? The idea yeah. of caching here is that you are avoiding uh, a, a trip to your database server, yes. Uh, server yes. which could be really time consuming, right? So mm -hmm. the idea is to hear uh, reply quickly by maintaining data uh, in mm -hmm. order of milliseconds, right? In memory, correct? Mm -hmm. So, but uh, that doesn't give you the, the, the QPS, right? I mean, one mm -hmm. server cannot handle if you're like billions of reads. If you take Facebook, uh, billions of reads. Oh, yes, have, yes, definitely. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, you so, need to so, have a so, lot of yeah, so to yeah, scale, yeah, to yeah, scale yeah. your re to scale your reads. Mm -hmm. That's why you need to replicate and you that's, have yes, yes. right? Yeah, so yeah, they're two different things. They're two different things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah correct. So yeah, yeah, I agree on that. So like if you're supporting on that scale, you definitely need to have a lot of uh, replicas. Any other feedback that anyone wants to share? Just one more, I think, uh, maybe kind of little, I think depending on the level, but um, mm -hmm. I like uh, some kind of, I mean, uh, uh, maybe you're also talking about some kind of guarantees, uh, semantics wise, right? What the cache can provide. Things like, mm -hmm. are we, pro, are we uh, is the cache going to provide read, read after, um, you know, write guarantees? Mm -hmm. things like that so, um so i, I think yeah. like uh, yeah i think in the beginning when we started the requirement i think we a bit, yeah a little bit yeah a little mm -hmm. bit yeah but, but again i think it depends on the level i depend on the level sometimes mm -hmm. this kind of thing expected sometimes they're not expected so it's, it's really there's no right or wrong answer yes 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 um okay hey one more hey, thing Praveen? i would like Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 one sure, more sure. thing I would like to say is uh, uh, we are designing based on one scenario, right? How will this architecture change once our uh, our use case changes in the actual production infrastructure? How will you change with that? Supposing uh, for write-heavy versus read-heavy, how will mm -hmm. you, what changes will you make? So if uh, when I ask a question like this, I generally give one question and then I say, how will you switch this to a read heavy? And, or if it's a read heavy, how will you change this to write heavy? And because in production infrastructure, making any one change is very difficult, right? It's lots of thousands of lines of code or configurations or testing. How can you create a, like whatever question you give, you have to answer also write heavy or read heavy, and then also hotspots. And also one more mention is the uh, load balancers, right? Uh, that was, uh, I think it was touched upon, but it was not uh, dealt a little bit. It could have been dealt a little bit more. Um, and each of the places, wherever we have, uh, based on each scenarios uh, the 
architecture will change a little bit, whether it's a NoSQL versus it's a Zookeeper or it's a eight and load balancers or it's a what kind of web server or application, Twitter kind of application where you have followers. Um, when treat, you have to uh, mass, uh, you know, send that to people who are following versus it's a Facebook uh, where it's a different notifications or it's a, just a Gmail where you are just sending an email and it has to go through different. Uh, so for each scenario, it's different. So what I wanted to add mm -hmm. is whatever question we ask, we should also ask the same person. How will you do it if it's a different scenario and what architecture changes you have to do? Yeah, I mean, like it depends on like what uh, and how much time you have and how, what are the evaluation points? Are you uh, saying like this is for the interviewer to check? Um, yes, interviewer okay. to check the interviewer. So in the last five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. um, the question I ask is if you had two days to answer this, right? What mm -hmm. are the what more areas will you try to incorporate into this? Because I know given only 45 minutes, you don't have much time. But if you mm -hmm. have two days, what more areas will you look into before you are actually implementing this? OK. So then he can put all the to do list, whatever we mentioned, right? I will also check this. I will also check the right through. I will also check the concurrency. That way, we know that uh, the client or interviewee knows about it, but in the interest of time, he didn't give all the options. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I see like Bupik was making notes like wherever possible. And uh, I mean, like Kasim had something in mind to evaluate. I think that's what he was going for. Maybe he didn't have this in mind, like yeah. going through alternate approaches. So, but like, yeah, it depends on the interviewer, like, um, yeah. But overall, I would say this was a great interview. And if mm -hmm. I was at the interview side, I will be happy with the interviewer. That, that'll be mm -hmm. good. Okay. Uh, I have one uh -huh. question. Can I ask you quick? Uh, uh, are you so ask? do you want to ask the interviewer or me? Uh, no, I want to ask uh, you, uh, huh? so the question is that what is the importance of back of the envelope calculations in this kind of interview and what kind of calculation we should do? Means I am a little bit confused about, I'm also preparing, so I have a question around that. Yeah, it's a good, uh, it's a good topic that you bought. I mean, like I have something around on that also feedback. So yeah, we will discuss about that in shortly. Sure, thank you. Yeah, and it's a good interview. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, any anything else? Anyone wants to share any other feedback? I, I think just one uh, final uh, feedback. I think mm -hmm. uh, the previous person was talking about right that uh, mm -hmm. if you had two days, what? So I, mm -hmm. what I found, I think, is uh, in the beginning, right? Kind of laying down all the things right for this system mm -hmm. in and the high level what building uh, i know uh, in the and the diagram I, I don't think we'll have enough time to put all of that mm -hmm. but if you lay down these are 10 things that are important for this area right mm -hmm. uh, and 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 uh, put that uh, you know ahead of time for example the cash you know there's a cash eviction mm -hmm. policies you know mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, i mean how do you support you know uh, how do you you know uh, read scalability right uh, uh, the constraints uh, put um, you know everything there like load balancing uh, all the problems there, right? Uh, and then start small. Uh, so this way for the interviewer, like they want to like, if you put all the problem space out there in the beginning itself at the high level, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. say, where do you want me to focus on, right? I thought that way, like, uh, you know, interior knows so you consider everything. And the second mm -hmm. thing is now like, um, what are interiors things important aspects, right? Um, mm -hmm. It could be like, you know, LRU algorithm, or it could be like, how are you going to scale reads? It could be like consistency. Mm -hmm. So then I think it would go in the structured uh, way. I know it's a little bit challenging to kind of put everything in the beginning, but I think it's a better, good idea to kind of write down, okay, these are 10 things I'm considering for this problem. So now let's uh, go on by, I'd like, let's go, let's figure out where you want to go. I think that approach may be a, a good, good way. Yeah, that's a okay. great point. Yeah, mm -hmm. that will be like a checklist. Right, correct. Because I don't know, we may not be able to get everything, but at least interview knows, okay, you know all these things and, and they will they will ask you on these things that they're interested in. I think that uh, that may be a good thing. That, that is a good point. Uh, but 
my like this is my personal opinion before doing anything in a system design interview have an agreement with your interviewer hey i'm going with 10 different things do you want or you want me to only focus on really important things so i would say if the interviewer is fine do it otherwise it could be like out of uh, way yeah and also it depends on the experience level also right like right. how many right. things you want to uh, lay out um, i have so... a quick question on the uh, algorithms part of it <clears throat> mm -hmm. so there are multiple places where we could go into the algorithm so lru is one algorithm here then consistent hashing was another algorithm and again we uh, talked about some high level uh, api structure for read and write so uh, i am not sure how much in detail should i go for i, I saw that uh, when asim was asking about the lru i was not intentionally going into the details of how will i find the candidate for eviction in order of one because i felt that it may not be really important for our discussion where we are talking about the distributed aspect of the cash so um, what is the right balance and what is the expectation from the system design interview in terms of coming up with algos and code yeah from my view um, like since this is a cash and distributed cash so i mean like before going distributed you need to explain how your cash works right mm -hmm. so to be able to do that i think you should have um, explained briefly how lru works and uh, like what data structures at least you would use I, I mean, like about here. Yeah, yeah. I, I have similar feedback. I, I think when you uh, put the initial high-level thing, I think that's where you can keep things very high-level, right? But when the interviewer asks you a specific area, it means they want to go in in depth in that area, right? So when I see ask you about LRU, my understanding was that you were asking actually, he was he was trying to check whether you know how the LRU algorithm really works or not, right? So then I would definitely go in depth in uh, uh, at least explain the algorithm. I, I think that at least I mean if inter ask specifically in an area and I think that's uh, that's a kind of signal to go depth in that area that, that's that's makes my uh, perspective makes it but uh, bhumik uh, your in, i would say your intuition was not wrong if i would be at your place by considering the time and the objective i have to solve yeah i would also get confused like whether i should uh, go it's it's again like a graph traversal like either i go depth first search or i go breadth first search. so <laughs> again i think uh, uh, my personal opinion the mantra is always check with your interviewer always mm. try to open a channel hey you want me to do deep dive in this or you are fine for now or uh, you want me to proceed further with the distributed aspect and we can circle back later if we have time because time is a key and it could be very easily uh, it could be easily gone if we take a different path so i i will say keep a balance of keep uh, checks with your interviewer that hey you really want me to do or if you if you don't know specific things about that you i think if i would be there i would be honest i'll say hey uh, i don't know anything about consistent hashing but i think it could work here i'm very much sure that mod and doing a mod modulus and would end up a big problems for me but consistent hashing could be alternative but i don't know exactly how it works but so you want me to think more you want to proceed further so interview would say on oh, okay it's fine i agree with you like so or it can, let's see how you can build a consistent hash that could be easily interview can go into out of league and start doing different things so be prepared because system design is a very subjective topic people can go any direction it's not like you start writing a code and you have to you have a input and output to give hmm. makes sense makes sense okay um anyone else want to share feedback or i can yeah nagar i think you can go ahead hmm. okay yeah i think uh, mine i mean like overall i think you guys did good like because uh, boomik like from your uh, on your feedback like you were laying out like the requirements and the apis and discussing about like lr you how you implement on the high level block diagram like and and the, at the end also you are trying to check uh, 
whether you are meeting the requirements so i think overall your steps look good like how you approach the problem and uh, yeah the specific feedback on like some of the items were like uh, yeah the one thing we already discussed on lru i at least like expected that you would say i mean like you mentioned about hash table like um, i mean like with the and when you are discussing about like adding a timestamp you didn't discuss about what's the time complexity of that because uh, you are expecting order of one right like but uh, i mean like after laying out your key comma value comma last access time and your logic i mean like it was not clear to me whether that is uh, order of one because yeah. that's what we need for cash so or like alternatively if you are aware of that uh, hash map and double link list uh, and using this lru so i mean like mentioning that like will at least uh, would have been fine like not like uh, some people even tend to go and ask like uh, uh, implement at least some high level skeleton for lru so you should be prepared for such kind of scenarios it depends on what the interviewer really want to test so that is one i think we already covered that and uh, another thing which i wanted to um, on the scaling uh, when you are mentioning about like how you uh, were adding cache servers like initially that was i mean like i don't know like it took some time for you to clearly specify how you are distributing the cache servers mm, i mean like uh, how you are partitioning like uh, what kind of data you are storing on one machine versus other like how you are partition partitioning that was not clear to me until like uh, the towards the end where you started discussing about hashing and other things and uh, the diagram like after you learned that you are using look aside cache um as yeah. per my understanding <laughs> when you say yeah. yeah so it, it is like separate right like look aside yeah. means you you get the data from database and you temporarily store in the cache yeah 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 so yeah but like it appears as though it's like right through cache so in the diagram yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so um that is one feedback and yeah i think that's uh, um on high level and one thing for a seem like uh, i mean like uh, this is uh, a seem like uh, this is a good candidate i think where we can ask uh, people to do capacity estimation because like generally when we are uh, designing cache like i think we need to know like how much of uh, data we are storing in cache like we normally do right like top top 20% of the data or like depending on some calculations how much data you want to store uh, in cache and like uh, we we could have asked bumik uh, to put some capacity estimations to see how much i mean like just to have a test of capacity estimations so i just have one spent? comment here that, that's a good point i think one mm -hmm. uh, since this is a, a, a is cache a generic mm -hmm. thing not mm -hmm. a, uh, mm -hmm. specifically focusing a use case at this point one mm -hmm. thing we could do is uh, we could just i think do estimates assume some estimation like uh, reads per second writes per second right <laughs> we could say like okay, let's say we're talking about like a facebook scale it's a few billions for reads per second a few <laughs> millions writes per second right and <laughs> then do read to write ratio 1 2000 <laughs> Mm -hmm. so uh, so because we don't have a concrete use case so i think we could mm -hmm. use some high level estimates assume some rps mm -hmm. wps mm -hmm. and and, mm -hmm. and reads to write uh, ratio and use mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. to scale our system yeah and also identify how many cache servers you really need correct. right like that's correct. part correct. of the goal correct yeah correct yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's a yeah. good point actually i think initially i was uh, trying to get into those uh, size of the object for each entry and things like that but felt like that was not the direction we wanted to go in so i never came back to it. yeah i know like uh, yeah i seem like it's did not okay, want yeah. you to focus on that so yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i have a question on the cache client the thing which i have added as the load balancer uh, to be frank i am not pretty clear on this i have somehow managed to give the answer there but i am myself not 100% sure on how do i 
uh, make this scalable or how do I optimize here, make this more fault tolerant. I talked about the active, passive, active, active, but it is still not completely clear in my mind. If somebody can like uh, maybe help how, how to do this better or what should be the right way to uh, I here. think um, that looks like more of a cache router to me that what you have in the diagram. Um, cache clients, I think it's typically on the front end, right? Like or on the servers, I mean like front end server or I don't know what, um, so like the where you actually query the database and store in the cache. Is that the cache client that you wanted it to be? Like I didn't fully catch the discussion there. Yeah, even in the cache router case, right? So cache router's responsibility would be to take the key from the all the servers which it is talking to and then identify the right cache server to land the request on. Right. So how would yeah. the so, cache router scale and be more fault tolerant? Right. So there are I think two concepts are mixed here. So one thing is uh, you need a router for constant hashing, right? Because you need to route the request to appropriate node, right? Which you're mm -hmm. responsible for. Okay, that's the that's that's the, you need the router for that. Um, second thing is uh, you need a needed load balancing if you have replicas, right? So uh, so it means like um, you have replicas, read replicas for the nodes. Then now you need a load balancer will basically redirect the request to a replica based on. Uh, you know which replica is be which is not. Hmm. So I think I think in this layer, uh, it's it's I think it's just not a pure uh, it's not just pure load balancer. It's it's a it's it's a mixture of uh, um, the router and the and the uh, and the uh, and the road load balancer. So the and, router would be yeah. a separate server and okay. How would we scale right. that and how would we make it tolerant? So so there are again two ways to do the router, right? So. So one way is that uh, you could uh, so the the client so you could basically uh, may, uh, we could use a what we call outsourced uh, routing model where you could use something like a zookeeper it's a distributed consensus node which basically maintains the overall routing information across all the nodes okay so and it maintains the topology it, it knows which uh, it knows which nodes are in this which cache nodes are in the system and uh, which nodes are responsible for what uh, hash range things like that and the clients first get the range uh, from the uh, from zookeeper and then use that to directly reach out to node to send the request so so that's one way the second way is um, so route uh, the clients could uh, they know all the uh, the cache nodes in the system they can randomly send to any one node in the uh, in, in in the cache uh, cluster and whichever random node gets it that it, it within the cluster it, uh, they all know who's responsible for what using kind of a leaderless uh, some protocol and then that that uh, a node can route the request to correct correct node so I've seen like different system used uh, it's, there is no one thing that uh, different systems I seen use different algorithms, but you can use basically the zookeeper model, outsourcing model, or you can have uh, one master maintaining uh, all the topology information and responsible for partitioning and everything. Or you could go to completely like leaderless uh, where you can send to random nodes. So it could use any mixture of these things. So in the case of zookeeper, uh, mm -hmm. that would be again like one block like this. That is, all the web servers now talk to zookeeper, and then zookeeper right. takes care of uh, sending the request to the right place. That also becomes one point of failure. I don't know what goes in yeah. zookeeper to make so it zoo all right. right. So zookeeper, uh, you, you generally don't involve zookeeper in the data path. What we call mostly control path. Uh, client, we may just like periodically get the routing information from there. Uh, you don't have to go to Zookeeper for every request. So data okay. directly goes to the node. Okay, that's that's one way. You you had to reduce the load on the Zookeeper. It's supposed to be mm -hmm. very quick read. And then again, Zookeeper itself, right? Uh, uh, it, it can scale on its own. You know, by having again, you know, uh, a failover. Uh, all of that is part of implemented part of Zookeeper itself. But generally, general practice is Zookeeper. You don't you don't put Zookeeper in data path. It just kind of a route lookup and then use that for some time to that. Yeah, and, yeah. Just to add on to that, like any like uh, in any system design interviews, like whenever you get this concept of scaling, you can offload that uh, responsibility right. to by right. adding a Zookeeper right. because okay. it's uh, 
yeah it is meant for i mean like it maintains that consistency and like it knows all the notes all the details like yeah right. it's like it takes care of that maintaining that for you all right mm-hmm. so yeah it's typically zookeeper used uh, uh for a few things the one thing is to maintain like a uh, uh, very small amount of data like routing information right uh, mm-hmm. and and keep it consistent and then provide the information to clients so so that's one thing and it also generally used for master selection if you are maintaining like a master uh, like yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, follower in the read so replicas it, uh, yeah exactly so you can use that for that master uh, uh, slave so there are a few things i think just re- if you remember that then i think we can apply that specific use case got it. let me ask one more uh, follow up question there so let's ex- uh, consider the case web, web server zero talks to zookeeper saying that hey for this range i should be talking to server 1 and for this range i should be talking to server 2 and the server one goes down now the web server zero has doesn't have the latest information because it is not pinging the zookeeper for each request so for that particular time there would be a bunch of cache misses right or other the uh, cache server won't be available so is that an acceptable scenario or is there a way to even make up for that so typically in that scenario right if zookeeper maintaining the topology in this case so uh, the, these nodes also send heartbeats to zookeeper so hmm. zookeeper would know if a uh, you know node uh, is going down then it can then it can assi- it can assign the range to some other nodes hmm. uh, but i mean there is always there is always i mean even despite of all of this right, there is always a short period of time where you may not be able to re- uh, re- i mean there is not in, in distributed system you cannot 100% guarantee that you know you, you always be able to succeed right you are all trying to really reduce the real really small amount makes sense makes sense yeah that was a valid valid point actually that the zookeeper would have taken care of uh, the server right. going down and repacking right. it to the different server okay right exactly. uh, and bhumi to add uh, one another point where you said zookeeper could be a single point of failure so zookeeper also maintains its replica but we say that zookeeper will always have consistent data although being distributed in replica and that's uh, and to do that they use a uh, consensus protocols and that's right. why if you will go to the zookeeper website they will say that we have done all the hard work of implementing consensus protocols to have replicas and give you a uh, consistent data so that you as application developers don't have to worry about doing all these things and that's why you try to offload these hard work to these zookeeper kind of services which have been already built uh using these makes sense yeah i right. think i should definitely right. read about it but right. <laughs> then i yeah, am so, wondering uh, the next interview question would be build a zookeeper <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah good uh naga i think you you were uh, um, continuing the feedback i so, sorry i interrupted you no 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 i think i was done like i just gave like one feedback for a sim like to would have to ask capacity estimation like and that's it i'm done so over to you sim like if you want to share feedback hey bhumika uh, i felt uh, we had a great discussion and uh, <clears throat> uh, this is my this is what i've seen and felt from system design interviews not exactly to find out everything from the candidate uh, that what he or she knows or doesn't know but uh, how that person would collaborate team fit and other things hmm. so based on the conversation i felt like we have a easy conversation uh, and the collaboration was really good and uh, you followed the pattern of having requirements uh, and uh, going through the high level to explaining things uh and you also wrapped up but if i have to tell you where we can do things different to take it to the next level so i felt uh, coming to the high level diagram was quick enough when we are in the requirements phase so we could have talked more but uh, in between i felt the shift uh, there was a shift from requirements to uh, high level thing so and then i thought okay let's move towards the high level and then i didn't consider that much going back and forth and getting the estimates so i would say like finish everything together have requirements and say like hey i want to do estimates it could be interviewer could ask you it could be interviewer could skip if 
he or she feels like okay the person does not want to do estimate it's okay let's go further and see and that could be a trick at the end i could easily trick you at the end say hey when how you will handle this much load now hmm. the interview could do that as a tricky thing so it's good to have agreement in the start only that hey you told me that time we are going to scale this much but now actually i want all my matches in doubles and singles so sorry i lost my train of thoughts okay uh where i was the back of the envelope calculations yeah so holding the interview responsible yeah so interview could trick you at the end so basically have uh it's handy in the start itself hmm. and uh, then i felt uh, there could be situations like uh, you may or may not know about lru so like i mentioned earlier just call out that hey i can't recollect or not on top of my mind what exactly you mm-hmm. do but i think this could be done with order of and do you want me to go more into the deep dive or want me to let's proceed further then up to the interviewer mostly i think 90% interviewer will say like let's move for further because i that person don't want to spend like 100% of time in just one single component and uh, <clears throat> and but if you know that's a uh, bonus point and i think uh, many people would know if i put like a human factor in this and if i've seen other people uh, talking about that and how much as a human i don't try to bias but i think some bias nice biasness would come here and there so it's good to know common things which could be really common like i love you i think it's a linked list uh, it's a combination yeah, yeah, of the linked list, list. Uh, add and remove elements whenever you are accessing and put yeah, them in the front yeah talk about uh, map and linked list itself i think interview would say okay okay i got your point uh, let's uh, move further and uh, i also felt uh, if you are doing uh, actively interviewing have a stylus pen it's easy to just draw some things and move forward rather than uh, it could be friction to bring each small uh, block diagrams if you are really comfortable uh, please go ahead with that but my suggestion is to use a stylus pen so do really quick and rub it which is not needed mm-hmm. and okay. uh, yeah and i felt like uh, uh, you were going towards the back end but we had agreement okay let's not focus too much on the back end just focus on the uh cache server saying you are able to give me a design how to distribute things we able to touch upon basic things i'm fine with that again i'm telling i'm not expecting it 100% you tell me what is consistent hashing but you able to tell like okay i have something in my mind i got a picture like how you will do it so basically overall i felt like every component i felt like a, a idea like how you will do it and then that's why i was telling you like smooth further i want to see other aspects uh, how you will uh, deal with the things so i think uh, this is my overall uh, feedback and i think uh, you already uh, able to get these things like use a zookeeper or a read replicas so that could help us to scale or distribute load and i would say this is this was not a easy problem to solve generally uh, if um, we are only focused on one component there could be system design questions like i tell you that hey build a something like a facebook or twitter there would be a lot of components you can talk here and there about different things like back end front end load balancer but it was really a very drilled down topic already so mm-hmm. i would say good attempt and uh, whatever the feedback is take uh, with a supportive way uh, this is i think for the greater good yeah definitely and yeah uh, uh, thank you so much and i'm glad that i did this cuz learned a lot of new things try to follow the template but i think that was the only thing i was able to do it in the right way uh, mm-hmm. uh, got a bunch of uh, interesting things as follow up so yeah i'll definitely work on those things and uh, hopefully be better next time oh so absolutely this is this is a incremental uh, thing it's things like agile 
uh, with yeah, increments yeah. we would be doing things and definitely there is always a room scope for improvement how much uh, perfect we are yeah definitely thank you uh, about the stylus i was just worried i tried uh, using stylus but my handwritings were already bad and using stylus was making it so oh, bad. so uh, i i was experimenting today with the draw dot io maybe i'll use the stylus next time I, 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 i am also in the similar situation but think in that way the more you use stylus the better your handwriting would become hmm. so if you use more it uh, eventually it you will start feeling yourself like oh how should i use it and then you you will make and i think uh, vivek uh, uh, once uh, gave, gave a really good tip i can share with you quickly uh, let's see i i don't have my stylus pen handy right now uh, but let me where is the annotation i can see that so uh, what i'm why i can't see the annotation where it gone okay never mind so uh, so i had to wake once with the uh, for this handwriting thing so his idea was uh, don't write uh, kind of cursive Ke- have each character as a separate when you write a b don't connect them write just a and then b then c hmm. automatically you will see improvement hmm. okay i can't a notice oh i can see so uh, i don't have a stylus here so basically a and even keep it simple b c how you will write d uh, e and f i and i think g h so something like this keep it uh, in a separate character and then if you have a next next thing like then just have like this makes sense yeah that's a good tip one suggestion bumit to you uh, so you took like all the boxes right server 1 2 you could have easily copied uh, like multiple times that same box i, I am pretty yeah. sure this provides this so that is one thing second you can uh, uh, there is one more thing which is easy uh, you can use google drawing so in google drawing you open the google doc and you can insert any kind of drawing inside the document itself so you can write and you can add the diagrams over there itself so that is also you can do and in that you know for arrows they provide like uh, hand arrows so you can add your own arrows anywhere hmm okay that's a cool tip thank you we'll try that uh, anyone else wants to give feedback i know vivek was like in a uh, noisy environment so otherwise he could have given some feedback Mm. this one last feedback can i give uh, one thing yeah sure sure one thing we missed is the geo thing like uh, is this cache is going to use by geographically distributed user or not uh, i'm not sure which is a part of this objective but uh, yeah we can go with that part that our audience is geographically distributed or not yeah that was not asked in the requirements by same so i think that was the reason why bumi calls didn't uh, think about it Yeah. so but it's a good perspective to yeah to um, ask the interviewee to see how uh, he will answer it see this environment mm-hmm. is now very much focused you uh this is just uh, i think this is uh, uh, something like how we have write this or memcache installed on uh, uh, some local servers but there could be a situation uh, how aws offers elastic cache which is uh, internally right space implementation i think all that pictures come things comes to picture when we are doing we are offering as a service but if i'm installing myself on my production servers then i know what i'm doing so basically i know in this region i have 10 web servers and this uh, five instances of cache is only uh, used by this uh, five web servers and some other region i would be doing something similar mm-hmm. does it make sense yeah yeah mm-hmm. okay so uh, this question could easily be taken into lex level like how you can build a service on top of it 
like a cloud offering like how elastic cash in aws works mm, yes and uh, bumik one more thing just came to my mind uh, it's, I, i think it, it could be good if we have discussed in the start or i could have also pointed out but why we want distributed cash can i have a cash on my local servers you remember i was talking you if we have on local servers so we have that problem free redundancy that's why we are moving towards distributed yeah 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 okay i think now okay. you're <laughs> no 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 i was just <laughs> waiting uh, so yeah i think this was a good discussion so yeah a lot uh, i think bumik also has a lot of things like he learned so um, so um any other final things that anyone wants to discuss like um, if any uh, of you are like willing to participate in the coming upcoming mock interviews or want to present um yeah feel free to ping me or asim or also sign up in the sport.stskills.com mm mm-hmm. hi so right now i have open till uh, uh, thanksgiving but uh, would like like people should fill up that empty slots first and then we'll open next slots otherwise if i open for next 2 3 months uh, yeah yeah we should not open too long <laughs> because mm-hmm. again people schedules will change mm-hmm. Okay. So there's still open slots. We have a slot. Uh, uh, oh, I think before that, uh, let's close the recording and then talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Just let me stop the recording.